Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation's Wellness Wednesday webinar. I'm Krista Ellis, Community Engagement Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues Jenny Fierde and Laura Cameron. Today we return to our palliative care series. Parkinson's is more than a movement disease that has motor and non-motor symptoms. Today's program provides an overview of non-motor symptoms that can be related to Parkinson's and how to communicate these symptoms to your medical team to improve your medical care. We will also discuss ways to improve care coordination and communication across your team of medical providers. We are recording today's presentation. You will receive a follow-up email from us with a link to today's recording and other resources in the coming days. Before we begin the formal webinar, I would like to share a little bit about the Parkinson's Foundation. There's so much to share about our organization, so I'll keep it as concise as I possibly can. The mission of the foundation is to make the lives better for people with organ for people with Parkinson's. Whether you are living with Parkinson's, caring for someone with Parkinson's, or working to end the disease, we are here to support you. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals, improve care for everyone with Parkinson's, advance research toward a cure, and empower and educate our global community. Today's program is a great example of one of the things we are doing to help us meet these goals. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly educational and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, our expert briefings, and our Spanish language programming, EP Salud en Casa. You can learn more and register for these programs by visiting parkinson.org slash pdhealth. I would like to invite you to join us this Friday for our live Fitness Friday session. This Friday, we will have fun for all in this active live workout using the whole body. Ooh. We'll combine creative movements to stretch and strengthen. Don't worry, I'll be moving with you all. Modifications will be given to increase or decrease the challenge, so it's up to you how much you push yourself. Sign up to attend the live stream at parkinson.org slash pdhelp, and I'll see you there. In June, we kicked off part one of a four part webinar series for our veterans living with Parkinson's. We will continue this series on August 31st with a focus on mood changes. So Dr. Vaughn will be uh, touching a little bit on our mood changes to in today's presentation, but we'll elaborate further specifically to our veterans community living with Parkinson's disease on our webinar on August 31st. You can learn more about our veterans webinars and register to attend at parkinson.org slash veterans or go to the direct link for the August 31st program, which is parkinson.org slash vets mood. We'd like to take this moment to thank PCORI, a patient-centered outcomes research institute for their implementation award to support our palliative care series. Thank you, PCORI. Today's PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation. We want to take this moment to thank the Light of Day Foundation for supporting the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. As we close announcements, we settle in to explore the invisible or non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. After the brief video, we will have a live question and answer session with our expert, Dr. Christina Vaughn. So please submit questions you might have throughout the presentation, and we'll be sure to address them during our time after the video. Happy viewing, and I will see you very soon. Pain for me is something that I experience all the time. And um, I've been thinking lately that I need to, I need to address this, but I, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Is this pain Parkinson's? Is it because I'm now getting older? Is it because of my exercise, which I'm always um, doing because um, it's, it's helpful for PD in so many other ways? Um, so I wake up in the morning and I have pain. Well, I, I, I have pain at night. I, every time I wake up to roll over, 
there's so much pain in rolling over. Um, and then there's pain because if you're in one position for very long, the pain makes you try to move positions. But when you do, there's pain when you, when you do. In the morning, the minute you step on your feet, there's pain that shoots up your legs. And then there's the pain from the stiffness of, of going in and doing your bathroom routine. Um, I think the, the only time during the day when the pain subsides a little bit is once you get, you've been done your stretches so that you can stretch out some of the pain um, and you've kind of warmed your body up for the day. But every time you get up from a chair, if you've been um, seated for any length of time, there's pain in doing that. And so I've been, you know, when I read some articles on um, your goals for treatment, I'm thinking that I need to add pain to my list because I'm not sure that I, sh I should continue living this way if I don't have to. Hello, my name is Christina Vaughn. I'm a movement disorders neurologist and a palliative care physician here at the University of Colorado and Shoots Medical Campus. I'm pleased to be with you today to speak about non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. My intent is just to have a very brief overview that focuses on three main areas. First, what are the non-motor symptoms due to Parkinson's disease? Second, how can you partner in care with your medical team? And third, some tips to coordinate care across the different specialties involved. So you may have heard this before that Parkinson's disease is just a movement disorder. Well, first formally described in 1817, Parkinson's has classically been described or characterized as a movement disorder since then. And that's because what's most obvious to other people, onlookers, are the physical symptoms that are visible. So that includes the tremor, potentially slowness, some walking trouble, et cetera, et cetera. Clinically, Parkinson's does represent a complex and multifaceted syndrome characterized by a variable combination of motor and non-motor symptoms. And you know, if you go to a conference or webinar or see other people that have the same diagnosis of Parkinson's, there's such variability. But it's the non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's that can start up to a decade before the motor symptoms show up. And those non-motor symptoms strongly correlate with quality of life. Back in 2002, a small study by Dr. Shulman and others in Maryland demonstrated that during routine office visits, neurologists failed to identify the presence of depression, anxiety, and fatigue more than half the time and failed to recognize sleep disturbance in at least 40% of patients. This was really eye-opening for people treating Parkinson's disease because we realized we were missing the boat and probably focusing too much or almost exclusively on motor symptoms. The main common non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's are depression, which is one of the biggest predictors of quality of life and is frequently under-recognized by clinicians, anxiety, apathy, sleep disorders, pain, fatigue, autonomic dysfunction, which includes things like blood pressure fluctuations and, and other things, and gastrointestinal disturbances, which can be present in both early and moderate to advanced stages of Parkinson's. So most people with Parkinson's report on average eight non-motor symptoms. And these again are often under-recognized and frankly unseen because these are often the invisible symptoms that are obvious to someone looking at a person living with PD. These are often more difficult to treat and they can impair quality of life much more than motor symptoms in some cases. They do have a greater impact, these non-motor symptoms, on care partner strain as well. And in this diagram, you can just see, just without even reading the words, how much of the body can be potentially impacted by Parkinson's disease, so many different organ systems. So for a more comprehensive list of potential non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's, the PF, the Parkinson Foundation, has a wonderful section of the website dedicated to this, so I encourage you to look at that. Successfully managing non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's can certainly take time and most likely involves lifestyle adjustments. Some symptoms may improve with 
Parkinson's medication, while others may require additional care, additional medications, or non-medication strategies. Exercise, dietary modifications, and talk therapy can each be key to managing some of these symptoms. And in addition, medications can be prescribed that can help work alongside the Parkinson's medications already in place. So which symptoms are due to Parkinson's and which are not of the non-motor symptoms? Just as the diagnosis is sometimes delayed because symptoms can be attributed to something else, even after diagnosis, many symptoms can either be mistakenly blamed on Parkinson's or attributed to something other than Parkinson's when in fact Parkinson's is the underlying reason for those symptoms. Hopefully that makes sense. But one important example of this is pain, right? A lot of people don't realize that Parkinson's itself can contribute to or cause pain, physical pain. It's a very frequent symptom. Up to 95% of people with PD have pain, and it certainly impacts quality of life in Parkinson's, but it's still underdiagnosed and commonly treated only unsystematically, kind of here and there. Pain can be primarily related to Parkinson's, but frequently it's associated with secondary causes, right, like degenerative joint disease, and even Parkinson's unrelated pain can be amplified by the Parkinson's symptoms, like the motor or non-motor symptoms. Think about the role of depression, which could be a Parkinson's symptom, which can amplify or make the pain feel worse, the physical pain that's happening. Alternatively, a physical symptom of Parkinson's, like potentially um, dystonia, a sustained muscle pulling, perhaps in the neck, can exacerbate pain that's already there due to neck disease, degenerative joint disease of the cervical spine. So this is really important for people living with pain to work with their providers and trying to understand the pain and figure out where it's coming from to help in management strategies. Sometimes an important way to demonstrate that a symptom is due to Parkinson's disease is to note the timing of it, right? So if there's some predictability to that symptom, that non-motor symptom, particularly related to the timing of the Parkinson's medications, this can help to highlight that motor fluctuations or doses of medication may be causing or contributing to this particular non-motor symptom. So it really does help to kind of take a step back and see, is there any predictability to this particular non-motor symptom we're focusing on? Does it fluctuate in a predictable or somewhat predictable way throughout the day? That can be helpful in trying to make sense of whether or not it's related to the Parkinson's. There are some non-motor symptoms that patients and families may be reluctant to discuss or haven't even connected the dots to realize that in fact these are related to Parkinson's disease. And here are some examples. First is sexual dysfunction which is really impaired sexual coordination, erectile dysfunction, lack of climax, hypersexuality, and medication effects, mood symptoms, fatigue, relationship issues can all be factoring in, but the underlying PD itself can contribute to or cause sexual dysfunction. And of course, that can be very demoralizing, disabling, and often underreported and underrecognized. Hallucinations and delusions are together called psychosis. And hallucinations in particular are abnormal perceptions without a physical stimulus that involve any sensory modality and may be simple or complex in form. These are typically vivid and well-formed. They occur when the patient is awake. So important to distinguish between vivid dreams when someone's sleeping and hallucinations which occur while awake. And these are commonly people, animals, sometimes insects. They may or may not have distortion in their appearance. And there can also be objects or lines that aren't actually formed that are also visual hallucinations. Now, what are delusions? Delusions are false fixed beliefs that are maintained despite evidence to the contrary. Paranoia, for example, is a form of a delusion. And these occur in variable frequency, both hallucinations and delusions, up to 60%. And these become more common as somebody progresses into advanced Parkinson's disease. What about impulsive and compulsive behaviors? These are often symptoms that folks may be reluctant to report. And this could include gambling compulsively, compulsive buying, sexual compulsions, eating behaviors, 
and this can occur in roughly 20% of people living with PD, and it's most closely related to the use of dopamine agonist medications. Uh, this is a particular category of medications used to treat Parkinson's, which can include pramipexol, ropinirol, the rotigotine patch, and some others. Examples that are even more uncommonly discussed include hobbyism and punding. So hobbyism is when there's a frequent preoccupation with the hobby resulting in negative consequences. It's almost like an obsessional focus on whatever the hobby is. Examples could include compulsive internet use, artistic endeavors, writing excessively to the point of it interfering with sleep overnight, and then punding. Punting is non-goal-oriented behavior occurring in up to 14% of people living with PD. Some examples of this include repeated manipulations of technical equipment or continually handling, examining, sorting of common objects. So maybe someone takes their junk drawer or empties their purse and just kind of rifles through the things, uh, the contents without any clear purpose and without really accomplishing anything. Most often, care partners are more aware of the negative impact of these excessive behaviors on activities of daily living and are just overall more aware of these behaviors than the person living with the Parkinson's. So I highlight these things as commonly not discussed or not recognized as potential symptoms of Parkinson's. So good to know about. So what about partnering with your care team? I mean, if you think about healthcare, it's kind of like a puzzle and you do control a very important piece. Your story, your life experiences and how they impact your health, these all hold clues that are just as vital as any test a medical person would perform. Thankfully, the majority of our life is spent outside of medical visits, though I'm sure it can seem like you're spending increasingly more and more time in medical visits. But the reality is most of your time is spent outside of the medical system. And that time is you could consider as the care between the care. And I highlight this because when you're not in a medical visit, there's a big role that both the care partner and the patient can play in contributing to their medical care over time. So the care between the care, so to speak, is the health care that you will need to manage and coordinate over time. And it's taking control of your health or that of a loved one. And navigating next steps could look like focusing on, I broke it down here, relationships, management, information, and personal agency. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you've got to find the right medical provider, right? The, the right fit for you. It's not one size fits all. And a local neurologist in town with a great reputation may not just may not be a good fit for you. So making sure you have the right medical provider and that you feel comfortable partnering with that person is the first step. And then establishing and, and fortifying that relationship by really sharing your story and life goals, because it's not all about medications and dosing. It's about thinking about the big picture, too. What's most important to you, you and your family, and how can the treatment of your Parkinson's assist in your life goals? So really, the more you share with your medical providers, the better your care can be. When it comes to management, you can think about this as gathering, tracking, and organizing your health history in one place. Having a file, for example, or a nice printout of the health history, a timeline, something like this that you, do, you just update when you need to. And once it's done, it's done. And it's very helpful for the medical team to know the health history. Sure, it should already be in the records, and it probably hopefully is. But just to be sure, just having your own copy of the health history is important. Consider using a checklist, and I'll expand on that in a moment. Checklists can be used for a variety of things, including tracking non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So more on that in a moment. And then when it comes to information, understanding your options is always critical. So if you have questions prepared in advance, in advance of your visit, your medical visit, um, that really helps guide the conversation and makes sure that you have what's most important to you as top of mind in the medical encounter. It's also important to learn where and how to get support and information. Certainly, 
I would start by asking the medical team, your neurology team, you know, how do I get more information? And then taking a role in seeking that out, whether it's support groups, whether it's national organizations like the Parkinson Foundation, there's a lot of information out there and getting some guidance from your medical team up front is always a handy way to start. And the more information you have and the more you've shared with your medical team, the better able you'll be to make informed medical decisions. Having the answers, having the information that you need from the medical team and them putting that in context of what you've told them already about who you are, that's the best way to move forward on next steps and make informed decisions. So when I mentioned the checklist before, this is just one example. There are so many potential kinds of checklists, not to get overwhelmed, but just to have an example here. As we know, as I've mentioned before, that non-motor symptoms are frequently underreported. In fact, one survey said that over 60% of non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's are undeclared to healthcare professionals. That's really eye-opening as well. And I think it's because both patients aren't aware of what non-motor symptoms are potentially due to Parkinson's. And it's hard to have everything in mind when you go to visit your medical provider. So having a checklist is one way to kind of wrap your head around potential non-motor symptoms and getting more, more information about what's actually happening at home. So patients with more advanced Parkinson's disease tend to have more motor fluctuations, but also have more non-motor symptoms than people with more mild or moderate Parkinson's. And those non-motor symptoms at that more advanced stage can be more severe and also can fluctuate just like the motor symptoms can. So as I said, a better way to keep track of the non-motor symptoms is to create a checklist like the one here. This is just one example. And it probably is a good idea to review the non-motor symptoms that you want to focus on with your medical team to ensure that the, the ones you've chosen make sense in your particular case. This will be extremely helpful to increase awareness of symptoms and also for the medical team to better understand how things are going in between visits. Because remember, when you go to a visit, all the doctor or the medical team is seeing is just a snapshot of what you look like or what the patient looks like at that moment. And it's not usually representative of the lived experience in between visits. So documenting in this way can be helpful. And then this care between the care concept, the idea that in between medical visits, there's still care going on and it can inform the medical care that you do receive during visits. These are some ways to be prepared for that. So before any medical visit for Parkinson's, it's important, of course, to be prepared to share your medical history and test results and to really have a list, an up-to-date list of the other medical providers involved so that the neurology team can reach out to the other medical folks and have open communication. It's good to keep a record of health complaints, symptoms, allergies, and medications, an upstate list of how you're taking your medications, and of course, to consider a checklist, as I mentioned, and then write down any questions or concerns that you have in order of priority in advance of the visit to bring with you. So during and after the visit, it's important to make sure that the options laid out by the medical team are understood in order to make informed decisions. So ask for clarification if any terms or instructions aren't clear or understood. Repeat the next steps that you've just discussed to the medical team to ensure that you got it, that you understood it, and that there's no miscommunication. And then make sure to make the follow-up appointment, schedule any recommended tests or assessments, fill the prescriptions if any have been ordered, and contact any family or friends that need to know what happened during that visit. So some of these seem quite obvious, but it's a good checklist in and of itself to remember key points leading up to a visit during and after a medical visit for the Parkinson's and what can be helpful. And then when it comes to coordinating care, the better the care coordination, the better the health outcomes. I mean, that is not surprising, but it is pretty common that many different medical providers are involved in the care of someone living with Parkinson's. Think back more than a century ago, an entire town would go to the same doctor. And for better or for worse, this isn't the case now, right? We have a multitude of medical specialties and subspecialties. 
And because Parkinson's can affect or impact many organ systems, it's common that someone living with PD will have multiple specialists, right, involved in their care, ranging from urologists, sleep specialists, dermatologists, gastroenterologists, etc. And so it can be tricky to kind of make sure everyone's in the loop, all the medical providers are up to date. And because not all specialists are familiar with Parkinson's or the many ways that Parkinson's can affect people, particularly the non-motor symptoms, it's even more important to ensure good communication between all the members of the care team. So first, I like to say ensure that the neurology team has an updated list of all the other medical providers and then ask them to send a copy of the visit note to the other providers. This isn't as hard as it used to be with our electronic medical record systems. If all that information lives already in the medical record, it's kind of a bunch of clicks to help facilitate the sending or the communicating of the visit note to the other medical providers. And then don't hesitate to access the medical records yourself. Once again, this is easier than it used to be now that we have patient portals within the electronic medical record system, which can be really useful to just kind of survey what's in your medical record or what's in your loved one's medical record and make sure that it's accurate or, or see what the, the medical providers are thinking. So it can be really empowering and important to access the medical record yourself. And all of this is really to advocate for yourself, just as you would if you or your loved one was going to the hospital, right? And the, a reminder about the hospital care kit that the Parkinson's Foundation has created many years ago, in fact, the Aware and Care Kit here. This is another way to remind uh, medical providers about the impact of Parkinson's disease and the potential symptoms and the potential medications that should be avoided and so forth. So yet another way to help educate potentially non-neurology experts on non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's and uh, the impact it can have. So I know that was a bit of a whirlwind, but I'll summarize here. Familiarizing with the possible non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease is really important because you don't know what you don't know. And there's a whole smattering of, of non-motor symptoms that may not seem related to Parkinson's, but indeed they are. Sometimes it's really hard to clarify which non-motor symptoms are in fact related to PD and which aren't. I gave some pointers few minutes ago about looking for any sort of pattern or predictability in the onset of those non-motor symptoms, maybe coinciding with medication doses and so forth. It's also helpful to keep a diary or a log or a checklist of the non-motor symptoms so that you can share what you've learned at home with your medical team when you go for a visit and, and review that together to make better sense of what's happening and think about a treatment plan or a strategy to make some of those symptoms better controlled. And I think talking about non-motor symptoms, tracking them and focusing on them is yet another way to partner with the care team. And please feel empowered to advocate for yourself or for your loved one with PD so that you can ensure all the medical providers are in the loop, in communication, know how to get a hold of each other and know about the impact that the Parkinson's is having because it can affect so many different parts of the body. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. Any initial remarks or statements you want to make before we jump into our question and answer session? I think that, thank you. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, I think that this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, what I spoke about. You know, it, it's an introduction, an overview. It doesn't get into a whole lot of depth. There's so many directions we could go with the questions, um, with specific symptoms. Um, so I think it was an intended, it was intended to increase awareness um, and inspire questions both today, but also with um, care, medical care teams. Yeah. And um, with that opening statement from you, we did get a question from one of our viewers. What should our medical team look like when living with Parkinson's? 
This is a, a wonderful question because on the one hand, you want comprehensive care based on that image I showed in the beginning of the presentation showing the variety of locations in the body that can be affected by Parkinson's, it makes sense that you would want to have a lot of different specialists. On the other hand, that can be really overwhelming and feel um, like who, who needs to coordinate all that? That's one more burden for the person living with Parkinson's and their family. But I think in general, the best thing to do is certainly to always have a good relationship with the primary care physician or, or provider um, that person is essential. And a lot of people feel like their Parkinson's movement disorders neurologist or their Parkinson's neurologist and neurology team almost replace that um, primary care role because so many other medical problems are seen through the lens of the Parkinson's. So it makes sense that you would check in with your Parkinson's specialist um, when talking about other medical issues. But nonetheless, having a primary care physician is essential for all sorts of things, checking, checking basic blood work, um, having screenings for things when you have infections, managing that, and so on and so forth. That person's role as the primary care is also involved with sending referrals as needed to other medical specialties. So a partnership between the primary care and the movement disorders or Parkinson's neurologist, um, that's an essential foundation. On top of that, oftentimes people do check in with a urologist for bladder dysfunction, frequency, urgency, overnight frequency or nocturia, urinating multiple times overnight, occasional incontinence sometimes, um, having a urologist to make sure that there's nothing anatomically that needs to be um, addressed and not just quick to blame it on Parkinson's, though Parkinson's often has many urologic um, symptoms or, or effects. Um, so a urologist can be helpful to check in with and um, sometimes a gastroenterologist becomes necessary, a GI doctor, when constipation becomes difficult to manage. But certainly movement disorders, neurologists and primary care doctors are equipped to handle or manage constipation. But if it does progress to a really difficult stage of, of you know, basic treatments aren't helpful, then sometimes a GI doctor can be helpful. Um, in terms of medical specialties, that's a, a starting point. But again, I can't emphasize enough the, the Parkinson specialist in the primary care. On top of that, um, I would say the medical team also needs to include the other professionals, such as rehab therapists, physical therapists, speech occupational therapists, and having periodic check-ins and sessions with, with people who fall under that category. It's also really important. Um, you don't know what you don't know, which I say all the time. And uh, rehab therapists have such a skill set where they can provide suggestions and ways to work on tightness or um, maneuvering out of a chair, out of the car, that sort of thing. Um, I think having them on your team and knowing that periodically you're going to be checking in with the rehab therapists is really critical. Um, there are a whole host of potential others, depending on your individual needs, but I'd say that's a, a starting point. Um, and yeah, I could keep talking, but I think there are a lot of other questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vaughn. And um, I wanted to share with our attendees today that we are hosting an expert briefing on Parkinson's disease in the bladder on September 13th. And one of my colleagues will, will put the link um, in our chat. So for those of you who may be challenged with um, urinary incontinence, all of the uh, urology stuff, please join us on September 13th to have a deep dive into, uh, into that subject. I also want to thank you, Dr. Vaughn, for alluding to the fact that this is very introductory. Um, there's so much that goes into the non-motor symptoms. And one of our viewers actually said, you know, these the non-motor symptoms impact my husband's quality of life much more than the motor symptoms. So just want to highlight um, that little nugget that she shared that is very, very true for so many of us living with Parkinson's. And also, um, Dr. Vaughn was typing in the Q&A, responding to questions during the video. So if I don't ask your question, it's because she already took the liberty <laughs> of answering it. So please uh, open that Q&A feature and see if your question was answered by her. One of our viewers, Dr. Vaughn Dathan, he asks us, how do I help my wife understand that there are non-motor symptoms, that the symptoms go beyond what she can see with my body? That is a very powerful question. It's very hard. 
especially when um, it's somebody that is right there with you day to day to day and isn't sort of on the outside or peripheral who can't easily step back and appreciate some changes that may have happened or the non-motor features. Plus people who really love you or care about you sometimes are inclined to um, reinterpret things, say, oh, I think you're tired because you, you know, you just, you didn't sleep as well last night or, you know, coming up with other explanations from a place of, of good intent, but maybe missing the mark. You know, fatigue, for example, is one of, of many um, non-motor Parkinson's symptoms that um, kind of creeps in, sometimes even present before the diagnosis. But, um, you know, that's something that can really take a toll and have a major impact on quality of life. And, you know, that could be an instance where the, the loved one, the wife, your wife um, may not necessarily discount it, but, but try to attribute it to something else or make sense of it in a different way. Um, so there are a lot of potential examples of that. So I think one way to, to really address that is to invite your wife to come to the sessions that you have, your medical sessions for your Parkinson's. Um, it's critical to have um, family presence there because um, hearing it from an outside party or having a, a Parkinson's specialist actually label, identify, label, and acknowledge the presence of these symptoms validates it some in, in some ways um, and makes it perhaps more real to the spouse or, or family member. So I think that's really an important part. And, and then that Parkinson's specialist trying to contextualize it and say, well, here's how this plays out, this non-motor symptom or this collection of non-motor symptoms. Um, here are some potential strategies. I'm a big fan of strategy, um, not just pills and medication. So thinking about some actual lifestyle strategies to help address some of these symptoms. Um, but I'll tell you, apathy, which came up in the Q&A, um, is another non-motor symptom that that is often overlooked, not recognized, assumed to be just depression, and spouses often don't get it, that apathy in and of itself, by itself, is a symptom of Parkinson's. And it can be such a source of friction in couples or in families when a spouse says, hey, why are you just sitting on the couch? You used to be so active or do yard work. There's so much to do. And um, and the person with Parkinson's is like, I just am sitting here. You know, I'm taking a break or whatever it is. So I think just labeling it as apathy when you go into your visit with your Parkinson's specialist can be supremely helpful and help to give the spouse or loved one um, more insight into what it is, that it's a symptom, um, and again, some strategies on how to deal with it. So presence in the visit is, is really a good first step to help the spouse recognize and appreciate the breadth of potential symptoms um, that Parkinson's um, creates. Um, I think that same question asked about a seven-year-old, if I remember, in the house and how to introduce um, such symptoms to a young child. Um, it's That's also a challenge too, um, normalizing symptoms of Parkinson's in the face of a young child. I grew up as a young child in a Parkinson's house, um, so I have a little insight into that on a personal level. I'm not sure there's a a right way to do it. I think a wrong way to do it might be to um, to just dismiss questions um, from the from the child and and just say everything's fine and and so on. I think um, potentially connecting with a support group for young onset Parkinson's and connecting with others living with PD and their kids and maybe having some activities where the kids get together and talk about it um, because having a child who lives in isolation and doesn't know anyone else going through having a loved one, a parent with Parkinson's um, can be a challenge. So not necessarily suggesting bringing the, the child to the medical visit at seven, um, but certainly having open dialogue and asking, checking in with, with the seven-year-old about you know, how they're feeling about everything, what they understand, how they're making sense of what they're witnessing and, um, reassuring them and, and being open with, with answering questions. I wish I had a more skillful um, answer. I would say too, that if you have access to a, a licensed clinical social worker or a counselor in the clinic, ideally an, um, a multidisciplinary Parkinson's clinic might have access to that. 
um, kind of a person who might have more skillful suggestions um, on how to address that in a young child. Thanks, Dr. Vaughn. You're quick with the second part to my question or to Dathan's question. So thanks for being um, so engaged with our Q&A here. Um, Monica asks, are there any tips on how someone can find the right fit when it comes to physicians? That's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, I would say that giving a few visits rather than making a a decision based on one encounter make a lot of sense unless that first encounter was just blatantly awful. Um, but if you're unsure, I would give it a few times, probably three times, because um, sometimes someone's running behind and, um, you know, they might seem rushed on a given day when in fact that's a one off. Um, so really giving them a chance a couple of times. Um, patient reviews can be sometimes misleading. So, um, I think read those critically, but but don't hold too strongly to the reviews that are online necessarily. Um, word of mouth is always a good way to first find a physician or a clinician um, and then check that person out. But I think you, most important is to check in with what you're looking for. Oftentimes patients want to be seen and heard and feeling like that clinician is seeing you and hearing you and remembering what's most important to you um, and not just recommending things based on what they think you want or is most important to you. Um, I think that is critical when you're trying to assess, is this a good fit or not? Making sure you feel seen and heard, um, I think would be a priority, at least in my opinion. Thanks, Dr. Vaughn. Um, a couple of questions about anxiety. Can you share a little bit more, uh, I would say probably the projection or when someone might start experiencing anxiety before the diagnosis, when, when can this particular non-motor symptom start to appear in our journey with Parkinson's? Great question. Like everything, it's variable, but some of the patterns that I see are sometimes people develop anxiety bef right before the diagnosis actually and they're feeling edgy or anxious, um, more irritable even, and there's no good reason, right? You're looking for reasons and um, other physicians are saying, well, I guess you're just anxious, try this medication. And in retrospect, you know, a year or two later, you look back and you think, ah, oh, that was probably the early signs of the Parkinson's itself. Um, some people, I used to work many years ago with a psychiatrist who was a Parkinson's specialist and she had this idea that there were these categories of people living with Parkinson's where there were some people that tended to tended towards depression and that was their picture. And then there was a distinct category of people who were just anxious. They had this anxious phenotype or this anxious presentation and that was their variety, so to speak, of Parkinson's. So I think that there's some credence in that. And I think there's some people that just tend towards more anxiety. Not everyone with Parkinson's experiences that. Anxiety also shows up um, early on or even later on in the progression as a feeling of internal tremor. And this is a non-motor symptom, interestingly, because it's not visible on the outside, but it's this angst, but this also vibratory sense that's been described where people feel an internal tremor. And it truly is a, a form of tremor. It's just not visible. And it's related to anxiety to some, to some extent. That can happen at any time, but sometimes people describe having had that happen before the onset or the, before the diagnosis. Um, anticipatory anxiety is another flavor of anxiety that becomes prominent for many, not all, people living with Parkinson's. And what I mean by that is the anxiety that comes about from needing an, uh, needing to make, um, make a deadline. Um, so somebody has an appointment or something coming up, some event, something that's out of their normal routine. And the anticipatory anxiety that builds around that can be a big source of anxiety that's pretty common in Parkinson's at any stage. Um, and I think that can be tr tricky, but the first step there is to acknowledge it and say, hey, I know that I get anxious in advance of a visit. We're gonna just have a checklist on what I need to have for this visit or for this event. 
and uh, get that squared away in advance so that when the day comes, we can lean on this checklist and feel confident that everything um, we're prepared. But even, even that's easier said than done. But if nothing else, acknowledging this concept of anticipatory anxiety is important. Anxiety can also appear, there's so much to say, um, can also appear when somebody's in an off stage where their medication has started to wear off or has worn off and they feel this angst. Um, important to recognize if there's a correlation between anxiety and where you are in your medication dosing for the day. If there's any sort of pattern or predictability to the anxiety, we might be able to adjust medications accordingly, not necessarily add a new one, but adjust the ones you're taking. Um, so there are just a lot of reasons for anxiety. Um, and I guess I'll leave it there, but um, it, we've, uh, suffice it to say, it can happen before a diagnosis, mild, moderate, severe uh, stages of Parkinson's and for varying reasons. Thank you. I know anxiety is a huge impact on our quality of life and living with Parkinson's. So I appreciate uh, you taking some time to, to really talk more about it during our time together. One of our viewers says, or asks rather, what guidance can you offer in a situation where everyone, including medical professionals say, you look great, leading to a sense of frustration. Yes. My continuous attempts to express how awful I feel, there seems to be no improvement in my overall being, not even with adjustments to medication. What would you recommend or suggest I do? Oh, that sounds awfully hard. And we see it a lot. And I think it is so important to bring that to light because there are all these well-intentioned folks in, in your life, probably, who, including the primary care or, the, or sorry, the physicians, right, or the medical staff who want to tell you, oh, you look so great. Oh, you're doing such a good job. And while sometimes that's nice to hear, right, you don't want to hear that you don't look great, but it's, it misses the mark. It it sometimes feels like they're dismissing your lived experience, right? Just, and it touches on this idea of invisible symptoms. You may look great on the outside. If you have a tremor, it may be well-controlled. You may be doing things, looking active, put together, well-groomed, all of those things. But on the inside, you're suffering. And I think it's important to just call that out, first of all, because I think a lot of patients and families live with that, where their medical providers, friends, loved ones are saying, oh gosh, you look so great. And, and you know, think about where they're coming from. They're trying to reassure you, et cetera. But again, it, it doesn't shine a light on the lived experience. What's it really like? What did it take to look so good for this appointment, to spend all that time getting ready and preparing and all of that? It probably took a, a great effort. And sure, you look good, but what, what went into that, right? So convincing people to recognize that even if you look great, you know, it doesn't mean you're feeling great. It doesn't mean life is easy. It doesn't mean that the last hour was easy. I think it's tricky. I think stating that, saying, I'm glad I look great, but the reality is I have Parkinson's every single day, every hour. I have Parkinson's and it has a mind of its own. And I do the best I can, but it is hard sometimes, right? Not saying it's hard all the time, but it is hard sometimes. And really trying to have a heart to heart with people. Um, because, you know, you can also use the iceberg example, the idea that the tip of the iceberg is what everyone sees, but beneath the surface can be this glacier sometimes, right? This huge um, mass of other symptoms and struggles and challenges. And I think really taking the time, if you can, if you have the energy to, to highlight this to people, um, including your primary or your, your physicians or medical team is really critical. Or just say, it's not helpful. Thank you, but it's not helpful for me to hear that I look so great. I appreciate the sentiment, but it's just not helpful. You know, try, maybe try that. Thanks, Dr. Vaughn. Along the lines of communicating, uh, one of our viewers says, I, I live alone. These non-motor symptoms really affect my life, but there's nobody here to see how it's affecting me daily. And I'm having a really hard time explaining this. Can you offer me some suggestions on how I can communicate these non-motor symptoms with my circle? Mm. Yeah, that's also difficult for sure. Um, well, I think 
when it comes to, first of all, naming the non-motor symptoms, I think people that don't get it or aren't familiar with Parkinson's can hopefully understand simple terms like fatigue or depression or whatever the non-motor symptom is. So really being careful about the words you're going to choose and make sure that they're understood. Sometimes apathy is a tough word for, for people to really understand unless they've really seen it up close. So apathy can be a harder one um, to explain to loved ones. But Using one of these checklists or going to the PF site and looking at the non-motor symptoms section and using the words um, and saying, hey, you know, I'd like to have a conversation with you about where things stand with my Parkinson's. A lot of people don't know, but there are a whole host of other symptoms that are quite disabling that aren't so obvious when you first see me or first see someone with Parkinson's. And then take one by one of these non-motor symptoms and say, you know, fatigue is a major issue, if that's true um, for me. And I'm wondering, have you noticed that about me? Do I seem fatigued to you? And if they say yes, say, well, actually, that's not because I had a long day, but it's, it's actually a symptom of Parkinson's. And try, if, if possible, to use it as an opportunity to educate or say, you know, have you seen fatigue? And they say, well, no, I haven't. Say, wow. I'm really impressed that I'm able to hide it so well, but the reality is I have to, you know, take naps or drink coffee or really slog through the day in order to just do the basic things despite this fatigue. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, in fact, because a lot of people don't recognize that this symptom is part of Parkinson's. So if possible to use the resource, you know, resources like what the PF has or other checklists and actually say, you know, this is this is the reality of Parkinson's. It's out there on these these websites and these resources. Um, I'd like to kind of highlight a few that I'm going through, just so you'll help to help you understand. Um, and and hopefully that's a start. Really appreciate all the guidance you're offering us today, Dr. Vaughn. A question that comes up pretty regularly, and uh, this one's for you, Daniel, and anyone else who might be thinking the same thing. How does stress impact our Parkinson's disease? Good question. Um, I don't know of any data that supports that stress makes the progression happen faster, but instead it can rev up symptoms and make it so that um, people feel that their tremor is getting worse so often. A tremor is a gauge of stress in a way. When people are feeling anxious or stressed, the tremor often becomes much more prominent. Same with dyskinesia sometimes. People feel like their dyskinesia, these you know, abnormal involuntary movements that they're experiencing um, several years into the Parkinson's can be revved up with stress. Um, and I think the threshold for stress is lower in Parkinson's so that people feel more stress than they did before. Because in part, I think it's because there's less of a buffer. When people have Parkinson's, it's as if there's less reserve to buffer that stress, those normal stresses of day-to-day -day life, driving in traffic, um, waiting in a line, um, worrying that your medication's going to stop working while you're out doing errands, all sorts of um, new forms of stress, but also less buffer to be able to manage that stress. I think it's important to shine a light on that and to talk to your family about it and acknowledge, hey, you know, I've noticed that my ability to handle stress is not what it used to be. And ways around that, we cannot ever fully eliminate stress as much as we'd like to, but the best, some of the best strategies include trying to, as much as possible, have things planned in advance. People with Parkinson's tend to not like to feel blindsided by some new event or some new thing they have to do. Um, and having some sort of preemptive warning before engaging in some new thing, new task, new event um, is really helpful rather than just springing it on someone. Similarly, telling someone with Parkinson's to hurry up or rush is a huge form of stress that, that people without Parkinson's often don't recognize. You know, say, hurry up, come on, let's go. That, that often causes freezing people to get stuck. It has the opposite effect. Um, so that contributes to stress too, a lot of times and educating your loved ones or people around you. Hey, please don't do that. That has the opposite effect. It does not help. Um, those are, those are some comments there. 
We're at the end of our webinar. I'd like to answer just two, maybe maybe three questions. Um, if there is a question that you asked that we weren't able to get to, please call our helpline. We'll also be sending a very comprehensive uh, post-event email that will include the checklist that Dr. Vaughn keeps um, referring us to to use and utilize for our management and um, and there'll be lots of other information in that post event email. So look for that next week. Uh, Trudy asked early on, uh, Trudy, can eyesight or eye conditions also be a symptom of Parkinson's disease? Changes in vision, perhaps? Sometimes. The most common is due to dry eye. People with Parkinson's tend to blink less often. We don't think about blinking. It's automatic. And there's a less frequent blinking that happens, which can contribute to dry eye. Dry eye can then cause blurry vision. That's the most common. There are sometimes changes in the retina on the back of the eye due to changes of dopamine that can impact vision. Um, there are specialists out there who are called neuro-ophthalmologists. These are neurologists and ophthalmologists. They have dual training and tremendous expertise. Um, if there is any question that can't be handled by a typical optometrist or ophthalmologist, a neuro-ophthalmologist can be a helpful um, consult to further investigate that. Okay, um, as a palliative care expert, Dr. Vaughn, I'm going to ask this as our final question. LB writes us, do I need a medical power of attorney for my caregiver? I only have one adult child. How can I convince her to move closer <laughs> to where I live? The learning curve for her is only getting, going to get more difficult with the lapse of time. So specifically thinking of medical power of attorney. What a great question. I really appreciate it. Medical power of attorney remember who that is. That is the person or people who you trust the most to be your voice if you can't speak for yourself in for medical decision-making. So if you're too fuzzy headed in the heat of the moment and the medical decision has to be made, who do you trust the most to channel your voice, so to speak? They can be anywhere. They don't have to be in your same time zone or in your, in your city. Um, they have to be reachable by telephone. The best is to also have alternates one or two alternates backup people if that person wasn't available. But it is essential for all of us to have a documented medical power of attorney that may change over the over time, but just document it, share it with your healthcare team um, to protect yourself, to, to try your best to ensure that your wishes would be honored medically if you couldn't speak for yourself, that you have a trusted person. Um, and I think um, this daughter sounds like a good candidate potentially but really critical to document it. Any final comments, remarks, words of hope, inspiration for our guest today, Dr. Vaughn? I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you as always. There's so much more I would love to say and share. Um, I appreciate all the questions. These are really thoughtful questions and I'm grateful for that. I think that the Parkinson's community is a very powerful one. I don't just think that, I know that. Um, throughout my lifetime, it's just been so impressive about, you know, watching the PF grow and um, support groups and communities grow uh, regionally and so forth. I think um, it's wonderful to be a part of that. Um, this is a self-selecting group, of course, of the people attending this webinar, um, being proactive, but I'd say please spread the word about all the resources available regarding Parkinson's and also don't hesitate to educate people who don't know about Parkinson's about what your lived experience is like. It's really it's really critical to help people understand that it's not just a tremor disorder or a walking problem. There's so much more to it and it takes all of us to try and spread the word and help educate others. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. And thanks to everyone here who took the time and took the courage to attend our webinar today. A follow-up email will be sent with a survey, so please tell us what you thought about today's program. You'll also receive a link to today's presentation with those additional resources. I will spend much time going through every question that you sent us today and making sure that that email that you get after the event um, has some resource you have access to to find answers that you're seeking. A reminder again, on August 31st of our Veterans and Parkinson's Managing Anxiety, Depression, and Apathy is on Thursday, August 31st at 4 p.m. You can learn more and register to attend at parkinson.org slash vetsmood. 
If you had a question today that was not answered, please reach out to our helpline by calling 1-800-4-PD-INFO or emailing helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact info to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital safety kit that Dr. Vaughn mentioned today. We thank you for joining us today, and I will see you soon again in Zoom land. Be well and be kind. Bye for now.